of these items are, again, from Chapter 3, Odd Numbered Problems 21 through 27. 21 gives us data for a sample that has a mean of 8 and a second sample that has a mean of 16. The two samples are combined into a single set of scores. And um, we'll read what A says. What is the mean for the combined set if both of the original samples have a sample size equal to 4? So what we're trying to figure out is the weighted or overall mean. And from our text, that equation is equal to the sum, sum of x1 for our first distribution plus the sum of x2 for our second distribution divided by the sample size for our first distribution added to the sample size for our second distribution. So let's look at what we already have. We already know what sample size is equal to for both distributions, um, but let's specify what we know for the first sample. So sample 1 we have a mean equal to 8, sample equal to 4, and as we've done in the past we want to know what the sum of x is equal to and again, the mean is equal to the sum of x over n. If we replace variables, we would say 8 is equal to the sum of x over 4. Therefore, the sum of x is equal to 8 times 4, and we get 32. All right, for the next, for sample 2, Sample 2, we have a mean equal to 16. We have a sample size equal to 4. Sum of x, we're not sure. So again, the mean is equal to the sum of x over n. We replace variables. 16 is equal to the sum of x over 4. So the sum of x is equal to 16 multiplied by 4. And we get, if we put that into our calculators, 64. Okay, so now we have all of the variables necessary to calculate the overall or combined um, weighted mean for two distributions. So again, here we have now our values that can be replaced. We have 32 added to 64 over 4 plus 4. Okay, I'm going to bring this down over here, and that's equal to 96 over 8 and that is equal to 12. So the overall or combined mean for these two distributions is equal to 12. And I want um, all of you to notice that 12 is directly in between, it's in the center between the mean of our first distribution, which was equal to 8, and our second distribution, which was equal to 16. In other words, when our sample size um, for both distributions or multiple distributions are equal, then the mean of the two distributions or multiple distributions is the average of the two means for original distributions. In other words, if I were to take 8 plus 16 and divide by 2, I would get an uh, average score of 12. For this next example, we are still working with the same mean. So our sample 1 has a mean equal to 8. And what's changed is now we're saying n is equal to 3. All right, and then we're going to have our second sample, sample 2. The mean is still equal to 16, but our sample is equal to 5. Okay, so again, as we did Previously, the sum of x 
is what we need to find out first in order for us to calculate the overall mean. So the mean is equal to the sum of x over n. 8 is equal to sum of x over 3. So sum of x is equal to 8 multiplied by 3. Multiplied by 3 gives us 24. So we have the sum of x for a first distribution. Sum of x for a second distribution, again, mean is equal to sum of x over n. Replace variables, 16 is equal to the sum of x over 5. The sum of x, therefore, is equal to 16 multiplied by 5. 16 multiplied by 5, whoops, <laughs> sorry about that, is equal to 80. Alright, so now that we have um, all the variables necessary to calculate the overall mean, we'll use our equation and we um, would say, so the overall or weighted mean is equal to the sum of x, which was equal to 24, added to um, the sum of x for our first distribution, added to the sum of x for our second distribution, which was equal to 80, over 3 plus 5. And what we get here is 104 over 8. 104 divided by 8 gives us 13. So notice that um, it's different from the first example where the sample sizes were equal. In this case, our sample sizes are unequal. And as a result, the weighted mean will be pulled closer to the mean of the distribution with a larger sample size. In this case, the second distribution has a sample size of 5, which is greater than a sample size of 3. Consequently, the weighted mean is closer to the mean of that distribution. That distribution, remember, had a mean of 16. Here we see 16. So the weighted mean is closer to 16 than it is to the mean of 8. And the reason is that it contributed more scores. It contributed more to calculating the mean of the overall or combined distributions. All right, in this final one, again, we've changed the sample sizes. So our first sample still has a mean equal to 8, but now the sample size is equal to 5. And our second sample has a mean equal to 16, has not changed, but its sample is now equal to 3. Okay, so again, as we've done in the past, we need to find out what the sum of x is equal to. So the mean is equal to the sum of x over n, 8 is equal to the sum of x over 3. Therefore, the sum of x is equal to, oh, excuse me, that is not right. Um, let me correct myself. The mean is equal to the sum of x over n. 8 is equal to the sum of x over 5, not 3. That was my mistake. 8 multiplied by 5 will give us the sum of x for that distribution. In this case, it's equal to 40. All right, again, here we need the sum of x for a second distribution. The mean is equal to the sum of x over n. 16 is equal to the sum of x over 3. So the sum of x, therefore, is equal to 16 multiplied by 3. And if we do that on our calculators, we should get 48. 
And I just want to note that you'll hear me over and over again reciting these formulas. The more you do that and the more um, you are strict with yourselves in terms of stating the formula and then replacing variables, the less likely you are to make mistakes. All right, so the weighted mean. Weighted mean, I'm just going to abbreviate since I'm running out of space here, is the sum of our, the sum of x, the sum of our x values for our first distribution, which in this case was equal to 40, and the sum of x for our second distribution, which was equal to 48, over n for our first sample, which was equal to 5, and n for our second distribution, which was equal to 8. So 40 plus 48 gives us 88 over 8, and we have a weighted mean equal to 11. So again, in all three cases, all three examples, the, mean, the combined or weighted mean are different, and they are a function of the sample sizes. So in this case, the combined weighted mean equal to 11 is closer to the mean of the distribution that had a mean equal to 8. And the reason, again, is because its sample size, I'm over here on the left, its sample size was equal to 5. So it contributed more scores. So whichever distribution contributes more scores, the sum of x will be greater, and the mean of the distribution will reflect that. So in this case, the combined mean is closer to the first distribution of 8 because it had a sample size of 5. Number 23, explain why the mean is often not a good measure of central tendency for a skewed distribution. So again, we learn the difference between positively skewed distributions and negatively skewed distributions opposed to a normal distribution. In a normal distribution, we have the mean, median, and mode all in the center. For a positively skewed distribution, this one, we have um, the mean as the highest value, the median as the center value, and the mode denoted by the values with the highest frequency. And that's different for a negatively skewed distribution where first we show the mean and then the median. Whoops. And the mode. I'm going to make that a little clearer so that we can see that. Median. In the mode, where the mode would be the highest value. Now, in cases that distributions are skewed, the mean is going to either underestimate or overestimate. So, for skewed distributions, the mean will either overestimate or underestimate. The center of the distribution. Take for example um, housing prices in, in the county of San Diego we um, may ask, what is the average price of a home in San Diego County? So the average price. That value may very well, and I don't know the exact data, but may very well be reported as $800,000. So if we ask the mean of that distribution, most likely it would be overestimated because we have um, communities where houses are valued very high, one, two, three million dollars. And those values would be calculated in the sum of our x's divided by how many we have. Again, remember mu is equal to the sum of x over n. Instead, if we were to line up all of the values of homes in the county of San Diego, 
a better representation of the median most likely will be five hundred thousand dollars and again that occurs by listing all of our values from highest oh, excuse me, low values or lowest to the highest right and what center value would represent the median again recognizing that it has no regard for what the highest value is or the lowest it's just going to find the center or middle value which tends to be a better representation of all of the values um, again recognizing that the mean is going to in this case be overstated by the highest values the mean will be pulled in that direction so therefore we recognize that when distributions are skewed the median is a much better representation of the center of the distribution In this next example, we see the application or purpose of calculating the mean when comparing distributions or trying to support a hypothesis. So in this case, we're looking at um, research conducted, or Schmidt conducted a series of experiments examining the effects of humor on memory. Um, let's just take that into consideration for a moment. We're not asked to identify the research or the null hypothesis, but I think it's a good idea to specify when we are working with two distributions. So you see the purpose of what we learned in Chapter 1 um, and also what we're learning this chapter in regards to calculating the mean of a distribution. So the null hypothesis right is going to state and by the way is denoted by h sub zero and we would say that we are examining the effects of humor on memory so the null is going to say humor does not have an effect on memory In this case, the researcher um, states that they do expect some effect. So the research hypothesis H sub 1 would indicate that humor does have an effect on memory. Again, we're not asked to do that, but this is what um, the researcher would, would state as um, the purpose of, of conducting this research is to hopefully, in his case, reject this idea, reject the null that says that humor does not have an effect on memory. Um, he claims that humorous statements are more memorable than non-humorous statements. So a humorous example is, if at first you don't succeed, you are probably not related to the boss. Other participants would see a non-humorous humorous version of this sentence, such as, people who are related to the boss often succeed the very first time. So again, we would probably agree that the first is a little funnier than, than, um, than the second. So the researcher then measured the number of each type of sentence recalled by each participant. And so we have two, two groups. Um, the following scores are similar to the results obtained in this study. So we have data structure two. We have two groups, right? The groups are being defined by the levels of the independent variables. So again, we have this level and this level. Okay, so the humor um, is the independent variable, and we have two different types of humor, humorous sentences and non-humorous sentences. So that's how we've created this experiment. We've defined two separate groups, and then we measured how many sentences were recalled by each member in each sample. So that's this data for sample one, this data for sample two. And all we're asked, even though I went a little above and beyond, is to determine if the data right, shows that it has an effect on um, memory. Excuse me, this should be typo here. memory 
Okay, so we're just asked to calculate the mean of our first distribution. Mean 1 is equal to the sum of x of 1 divided by n1. And so all I want you to do, first of all, is to identify how many individuals in our sample. So we have, if we count all of these 4 by 4, we have 16. And then if we take the sum of all of these values, the sum of x1, take the summation of all of those, we should get 68. 68. And therefore the mean is equal to 4.25. So again, how would we read this? We would say that those who were exposed to the humorous sentences on average recalled four and a quarter sentences. All right, let's see if that's different from our second distribution. So the mean of our second distribution is equal to the sum of x2 over n2. And again, we have 4 by 4, so we, we have 16, so we have equal sample sizes. So 16 is the sample size for our non-humorous group. And the sum of x, again, if we just take the sum of all of these x values, we should get 49. 49. So the mean of our second distribution is 49 divided by 16. And if you enter that into your calculator, I believe the answer is 3.06. Here, 49 divided by 16. Three, if we round, 3.06. 3, if we use the uh, fourth digit right of the decimal, we would round. And again, we would um, state this as the average number of sentences recalled by those that were exposed um, or placed in the non-humorous sentence group. So on average, they were able to recall approximately three sentences. And then finally, all we're asked to do is compare. At this point in our understanding, we would conclude that um, the humorous group was able to recall more sentences. However, I caution, again, at this level of our understanding, that would be an appropriate conclusion. But given what we learned in chapter one, we learn that when we see differences between groups, we then have the um, responsibility of explaining that difference using one of two things. It's either due to sampling error, it's just by chance that we see this difference, or to prove statistical significance is the difference between 4.25 and 3.63 large enough for us to conclude that the humorous sentences do improve or have an effect on memory. Okay, so I just want to caution you that at this point it would be okay to say that the humorous group does recall more and there seems to be a difference but we would have to prove that that difference is statistically significant and not due to sampling error or chance in order to reject the null hypothesis. Number 27, similar to the last example, we're comparing the mean of two different groups. Um, in chapter three, we mentioned a research study demonstrating that alcohol consumption increases attractiveness ratings for members of the opposite sex. In the actual study, college age participants were recruited from bars and restaurants near campus and asked to participate in a market research study. During the introductory conversation, they were asked to report their alcohol consumption for the day and were told that moderate, should be a little E in there, consumption, consumption would not prevent them from taking part in the study. Participants were then shown a series of photographs of male and female faces and asked to rate the attractiveness of each face on a scale of 1 to 7. The following data duplicate the general pattern of results obtained in the study. The two sets of scores are attractiveness ratings for one female obtained from two groups of males. Those who had no alcohol and those with moderate alcohol consumption. 
so again, just to summarize, um, we have two groups of men in this case and those who had no alcohol and those who had consumed a moderate amount. And both um, are rating one female, one female in particular, and it's the same female face in this photograph for both groups. So again, we're holding that constant. Um, and again, we're implementing control, as we learned in chapter one, control over the research scenario so that um, the individuals are being exposed to the same face and therefore what we're measuring is the difference in attractiveness ratings based on how much alcohol was consumed. So similar to what we did in the last example, the null would say that um, alcohol oops, alcohol has no effect on judgments of attractiveness. Now based on previous research, you know, this is how we've developed this new research um, hypothesis. And based on previous studies, we would claim that alcohol does have an effect on judgments excuse me I'm gonna go correct my writing over here judge mints it's not always easy to write on the iPad of attractiveness And so we are, as researchers, hoping to reject the null. The null says that there's no effect. Our hypothesis says that there is an effect. And in order to reject the null, we will have to see if there's a difference in the average attractiveness score given to this one particular female. So again, we need to calculate the mean of our first sample, the mean of sum of x of 1 over n1. and um, Let's replace variables. Again, we can figure out easily how many individuals we have. So it's one, two, three, four, five by three. So three by five, we get a sample size equal to 15. And then the sum of x, again, it just requires that we take the sum of all of these scores. We should get 53. So 53 divided by 15, our first sample yields a mean of 3.53, um, check that in your calculator. So again, 53 divided by 15, we get 3.53. The second mean, again, the sum of x divided by n for a second distribution, we can replace the variables that we know or can calculate. Again, 3 by 5, so we know that the sample is equal to the first, it's 15. The sum of x, again, just take the sum of all these x values, we should get 74. So the mean of our second distribution is simply 74 divided by 15, and that should give us a quotient of 4.93. Okay, so again, at this point, the researcher could say that the average score um, for this female face um, was 3.53 when rated by those who had not had any alcohol. And the same female was rated as a 4.93 for the males that did have some alcohol in their system. So again, at this level of our understanding, we would say that we would reject this, the null that says there was no effect, and since we see a difference, we would have support for this idea that alcohol does have an effect on judgments of attractiveness. However, our job, um, as we learn more about how to use statistics to accurately reject a null hypothesis, we recognize that we must prove statistical significance, again, meaning that 
the difference between 3.53 and 4.93 is large enough for us to say that this difference is not simply due to chance or sampling error, that it is due to the manipulation of the independent variable, which is taking alcohol consumption and, and dividing into two categories, no consumption and moderate consumption.